Good morning. Uh, we will now kick off our webinar today presented by the Motor Safety Association on first aid kit risk assessments that meet the CSA standard Z1220-17. My name is Ryan Bast and I'd really like to welcome you uh, to this opportunity to have this discussion and go through this tutorial this morning on this new assessment tool. I'm joined with my counterpart in Saskatoon, uh, Nathan Kostrin. Nathan, are you able to uh, unmute and introduce yourself this morning? You bet. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, uh, yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for being with us here uh, this morning. Um, uh, I'm not going to be uh, really presenting. Ryan's going to be kind of leading the charge on that front, but uh, I'll be in the background kind of uh, answering questions that come up through the question box. Um, if there's some good questions that I feel are uh, going to be good for the entire class or they might be covered later on throughout the um, uh, webinar today, uh, I'm going to save those questions for the end and we're going to address them uh, to the entire audience and Ryan might be able to uh, help us out and answer those for everybody. But uh, if they're kind of more basic questions, I'll be in that uh, question box uh, answering throughout the day today and uh, just kind of being in the background of things. So. I'm gonna kick it back to Ryan. Thanks again for being with us, everybody. Hope you enjoy the webinar. Great, uh, thanks, Nathan. And uh, yeah, please do engage and ask your questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, we won't be stopping to answer them all immediately. We're gonna leave those to the end uh, because what the flow of the presentation this morning will be is we have an eight page document with a preamble of the process for the first aid kit risk assessments followed by a two-page assessment tool, which I will go over with you. And then we have some pages regarding first aid kits and what's in the kits, but then we wrap up by showing you a completed first aid kit risk assessment. So as we go through this, you may seem like, oh, this might not uh, make sense or uh, will look a little bit different perhaps. Uh, but as you go through it, um, hopefully by going through it the second time, we will have uh, given you that opportunity to, um, uh, to see it in action. Uh, just a couple tech things I'll quickly mention. Uh, if you do have any uh, issues, whether it be audio or video, I encourage you to log back in uh, and, um, and to do so at that time. Sometimes people may have an audio challenge. Uh, I've seen people sometimes go through on their telephone as well, and they're able to hear the content through their telephone and see the slides on their screen. Uh, but hopefully uh, we don't run into any of those types of issues. Uh, if there is, I would assume it's a one-off because uh, uh, everyone else seems to be working just fine. Sometimes there's issues with updates and firewall protection and those types of things, but uh, we will uh, be recording the webinar and uh, providing these types of sessions again in the future because it is a popular topic. Uh, so I'll kick it off by just indicating that on uh, April 1st of 2021, uh, we've seen a regula regulation change in Saskatchewan. And at that time, the requirement to conduct the first aid kit risk assessment at each location was introduced. And to make this a bit easier for everyone, um, in the handout section, uh, you will have received a interactive tool that you can use for the first aid kit risk assessment. Uh, it's what I'm going to be using right now for the webinar, and it's on our website. Also, we have the CSA standard view access as a handout as well as the legislation we've included in handouts because there were some recent regulatory changes, just so you have the most current instructions. Uh, don't worry about uh, writing anything down. As I mentioned, we will uh, record the session and uh, be able to conduct future sessions like this and uh, build on this type of information with support and uh, give you some direction as well with proceeding on this task. And as mentioned, um, I will go through the whole process once and then do the uh, assessment again by showing you a completed example. So uh, when we think about that, uh, not to worry or, or panic if we might not understand it initially. But as we begin, I always like to kind of take the temperature and see where we're at. And I'm going to just launch a quick poll this morning and just to see what your participation is. 
has your business already completed a first aid kit risk assessment since the April 1st legislation was implemented? So I'm going to give you a little bit of time here to uh, to do that, and uh, then that'll kind of help us see where our audience is at this morning. Okay, I'm going to close out the poll here, and we're going to share that. So it looks like 12% um, of you have uh, already done this, but 88% have not. So we've definitely have some uh, some opportunities uh, in the 12% who have done that. Uh, that's great. I appreciate that, and uh, looking forward to, uh, to working with the uh, the other 88 uh, the 88 percent um, of you as well as we go through this process this morning. So as I mentioned, I'm just going to scroll through the document. This is the eight-page file uh, that you would have received. And um, as we first take a look at it, um, it reflects just back to our website where we do have links, uh, which include the risk assessment tool that the file is that we're looking at, as well as the OHS Act and regulations. And we have some tables that explain those changes that have came forward. So that links you back to that. Uh, in the second paragraph, we speak to having what's called view access of the CSA standard. So what view access does, it allows you to look at the standard, but it doesn't allow you to print it or download it. So it allows you an opportunity to see what's in Z1220-17 for first aid kit risk assessments. So that's something that uh, people um, may be interested in viewing, uh, but I'll tell you, uh, we ended up purchasing the standard and we used the standard to build this tool. So a lot of the verbiage that comes out of this and the way items are worded uh, come directly out of the standard. And I strongly believe that this document fully meets the CSA standard as it was built on every premise of what that standard outlines. So we've got a good tool here that people can use to, uh, to work through this process. And as we look at the process, um, one of the things we talk about is the new regulation requires an employer to complete a workplace first aid kit risk assessment and the risk assessment will determine the risk classification of the work site, which is then used to determine first aid kits, uh, the personnel uh, that's required for the work site. And I believe that's why we're all here today. Uh, that's the, the piece uh, that was within the legislation that really stands out uh, and the standard uh, is specifically around this item. One of the key components of the standard it speaks to having this completed by a competent person and reviewed annually as when business circumstances change. And sometimes people, I've had some calls because we rolled this out last, uh, last Monday already on the 19th, we rolled out the tool. Some people asked, what is a competent person? If we were to go strictly by the definition, it's defined as someone that has knowledge, experience, and training to perform a specific duty. But when I try to relate this back, to make it easy uh, for everyone on the call today, um, if I were to think of who is a competent person as it pertains to this, it could be your first aid attendant, uh, perhaps a supervisor, a committee member, or a manager. If you'd ever taken our supervisor or committee training in the past, we go over how to complete uh, risk assessments. So that would make you a competent person as well. So just to keep that in mind, uh, uh, those would be good examples of competent people. And uh, I did actually have a member that I spoke with last week, and she indicated that her first aid kit supplier, the one that comes out to her business and restocks her first aid kit, um, is going to do this type of assessment on her behalf with her. 
So she deemed um, him as a competent person because he's in the first aid business. Uh, but with that being said, as we look at the tool, it pertains to business activities that happen. Uh, so it's more or less a they would have to collaborate together uh, to work on this because uh, she would have the knowledge of the business activities occurring at her business that pose risk and the uh, first aid uh, supplier would have a good understanding of the assessment tool uh, as well. So there are some, some different ways of, of looking at it and getting people involved. Uh, one thing I will mention is we are here to support you. Uh, if you do have questions uh, about how to do this process, um, feel free to contact us. Our number and email address is on the screen. Uh, once the webinar is over, for the 88% of you who haven't done this, let us know if you need help. I know we're meeting with someone virtually at one o'clock this afternoon to work with him at his business. So we are here to offer that mechanism of support to walk you through this process. It's not, here's the tool and see you later. <laughs> we want to be here to, to give you that support necessary uh, to do this. Another item I'll kind of mention on here, it does speak about when business circumstances change, you may need to do this again within that annual period. And a good example of that would be is if I have an auto parts store, and maybe I've added an, an addition onto my business, and now I do spray on box liners or undercoating. So that would be a significant difference in my business activities, and therefore it would generate a requirement to do this process again, because the duty of our work and our processes have significantly changed. So that's something good to, uh, good to be aware of as well. So if there's a situation where business circumstances significantly change, uh, you would need to do this again within that annual period. And of course, this isn't a once and done, so it is that annual requirement to uh, uh, do this every year. It's a great uh, thing to set in your calendars and know about uh, conducting it annually to uh, uh, update it. Couple other items I will mention before I move into the tool. Uh, once you do complete this process, you do not need to send it into our staff. Uh, this is your own document. Uh, the OHS division does not also need you sending it into them. You do need to retain a copy of it, which is readily available. If you choose to post it on your safety committee bulletin board, uh, that is also fine. Uh, again, as long as it is readily available. So I think I've covered off the uh, the first page of the preamble quite well, and uh, just want to reiterate the history of kind of how we got to this point uh, for this requirement, as well as to offer our support uh, through our phone number and contact information as we go through this process. Uh, so with that being said, um, again, I've appreciated the questions that have came in and Nathan has took care of those. It looks like mostly uh, people with bad internet um, where, or some issues like that may be some of their barriers that they have. So uh, again, we will uh, move uh, on now into the tool itself. So the very first thing that you see is your business name and location. So you would fill that in. And by location, that would be the town or city that your business is located in. It is important to remember that when you do this, it needs to be completed for every location. If you have seven businesses in your location network, each one of those needs to have one of these assessments completed. Okay, so it's not one for the entire group, it's one for each location. You can do this by department. Uh, depending on your business structure, if you're a larger business, uh, if you break this down into departments, it will give you a more precise sampling of the tasks that are occurring. Uh, if you're a smaller type of business, you may do this as a complete assessment that's not broken down by departments. So you, you do have that flexibility uh, when you are looking at job tasks. 
So again, if you departmentalize it, or if you look at tasks within your um, business as a whole, you have that opportunity to make that judgment call uh, when you are filling this in. I would think that uh, in, in part A, if you would come up with three to five different tasks, whether it be in your department, if it's a larger business, or as in your business as a whole, if it's a, a smaller bit type of business, you may come up with a three to five uh, common job tasks that we could look at assessing. And, and when we look at these types of tasks, it's important to know we are looking at the frequent overall job tasks for each department. And just to give some clarification, uh, this could be changing tires, painting cars, fixing campers. Those would be frequent types of activities that occur um, at a type of business. So when we think about that, it gives you some ideas. And when we look at this, uh, if your business has completed risk assessments in the past, or if you've taken any of our training, uh, you're at a bit of an advantage point because you've already have a bit of an idea or sampling of tasks that pose various risk levels. And you can work off of those by plugging them into this here assessment tool. However, I will mention this does not replace uh, your existing assessment or hazard analysis process. This is solely meant to give you a snapshot and a picture of what is your requirement uh, in assessing your first aid needs based on the tasks that occur at your business location. So hopefully that's clear because it's an important piece to this. And what I will mention, when you are itemizing these job tasks, think about the hazards, uh, whether it be biological, chemical, physical, ergonomic, psychosocial, and environmental. So the, the items, if you can see where I'm kind of moving my mouse around, this all comes out of the CSA standard. This is giving you direction of what you should be thinking about uh, when you are considering those tasks. I had a call yesterday on this and people were wondering, uh, what about, again, where do I start? I'm in a larger business. I said, well, uh, when, we, when we can complete this assessment, Look at injury trends and stats. Have you had a claim before? If, if you've had a claim, there must be some risk involved if we've seen a workplace injury. So you start there. So again, this is meant to uh, give you a bit of a list uh, to start uh, when we look at uh, doing this type of assessment. Uh, so again, uh, this is a good, uh, a good starting point uh, that's, that you can do. And um, this is uh, meant for uh, that process. So what we would do is, again, we would itemize those job tasks, and then we would evaluate the severity. So the severity is how bad or severe could someone be hurt doing that job or task. And you would rate that on a one to three scale, one being low, two being moderate, and three being high, and you would put that number in. Then I look at the frequency. How often am I doing that job? Is it something that's rare? Uh, is it a regular occurrence? Or is it happening all the time? And I would make that assessment at this point on a scale of one to three on how frequent that task is occurring. Next, I would look at the probability which is the likelihood of an injury occurring. And if you've done things to mitigate risk, such as PPE, you would consider that in your probability score, and you would put that in as a one to three score. So once we have that in, we would have a number because we're gonna add up our severity plus our frequency plus our probability to determine what our total risk rating is per job, okay? So we will do that for each of the tasks that we itemized in part A. So that's an important uh, component, so I'll kind of let that uh, settle in for a second. Okay, we would then move on to part B. 
And this is very straightforward. Uh, part B just asks you to make a determination on what's my travel time and distance to the nearest medical facility. And parameters are itemized, whether it's uh, less than 15 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, or 30 minutes or greater. And you would score that accordingly as well on a scale of one to three. Very straightforward. And the same with part three, or part C, pardon me, on workplace risk rating. Uh, this verbiage comes directly out of the CSA standard uh, assessing that workplace risk rating. And this makes you take an overall look at your workplace based on these definitions and assign a rating score, okay? So you're basically looking at what you're doing. What is a rating when I look at the whole business as an overall assessment? And an example of a, a medical facility is a healthcare practitioner, someone that provides healthcare uh, within your business. So a doctor's clinic, a medical clinic, uh, any types of those medical facilities uh, would be applicable in this category. Uh, the caveat to that, of course, is if you are, um, I know in some different uh, rural areas, I come out of a rural area myself, uh, sometimes we have hospitals, but there's no doctors in them. So that's a little bit different. Uh, so we, you, would, uh, you would know this based on your own locations that you're assessing this on and what the nearest medical facility is with healthcare practitioners that provide healthcare. So keep that, uh, that in mind as well. And again, talking about the workplace risk rating, we discussed that on a scale of one to three. And that leads us into our part D component. And this is essentially the calculation piece. We use the calculation below to only for the job task with the highest risk rating from part A. Okay, so I'm gonna back up the, the bus here to part A. When we did those three to five different tasks or whatever we choose to determine, we are only concerned about the item task with the highest risk rating because we want to ensure that our first aid kits and our training of our first aid attendants meets our highest need. So that's why we take the highest number uh, out of this category. And we would plug that into here as our part A. So again, we take the highest score from part A, we add our travel time score, plus our part C risk rating score to come up with our final risk score, okay? So that is the main component of what we're doing. Once we've uh, assessed this, uh, the rest of the form is very straightforward. Uh, so the, again, that initial calculation piece of, of going through it, determining your tasks, um, and going through that process uh, is so critical. And as we look at uh, as we look at that uh, piece uh, again, we will um, move on with our items of Part E, and this is now where we um, apply our risk rating to select the type a first aid kit that we would require. So based on our risk score, whether it was score between five and seven, eight to 11, or 12 to 15, it would determine what type a first aid kit that we need. And you might be asking, what are in the different types of first aid kits? And we'll get to that. Uh, those are in Appendix A. Uh, you see the clear separation of what's in a Type 1 kit uh, designed for people who maybe work alone or if they're on a service call or in a remote uh, area by themselves or they're working from home. Those would be people that would be first aid kit Type 1. Uh, the Type uh, 2 is your basic and Type 3 is intermediate. So again, I won't go into the specifics until we go through the appendix because that will uh, give you a little bit more 
an actual um, itemization of what's in those t first aid kits. But for the sake of this assessment, we've evaluated our risk to determine what type of first aid kit we need. Uh, the next piece is our part F, and this is where we look at the quantity of our staff. So it's clearly outlined. Uh, these parameters were set out in the CSA standard uh, to consider. And this is not the staff of your entire dealer network or group of businesses. This is the staff at your location. If that number fluctuates with summer staff or seasonal workers, you would include those in the assessment as well. And when you look at this piece, so for example, if I have 30 staff, I'm sitting at a 26 to 50 category. And with this number in mind, as well as your risk rating, you would communicate this to your first aid kit supplier or vendor, uh, the one that sells you your first aid kit products. You would say that, hey, our business uh, scored a moderate risk rating. We have 26 to 50 staff, and um, we'd like to order our first aid kits. And the supplier will give you the uh, recommendation on how many first aid kits that you need as well at that time. And we tell people and businesses, employers, it is okay to obtain additional first aid kits that exceed the minimum requirements. That's up to you. Uh, what this tool is designed to assess is your risk and requirement for the type of first aid kits, as well as the training requirements. And uh, that's when your supplier comes in, they can work with you, they all have a chart as well, because there's different ways they can mix and match. They may say you need one type three and two type two first aid kits. So those are some various options uh, and getting to where you need to be. Uh, what I will mention is uh, when you are thinking about this type of thing, uh, if you have different buildings on site, sometimes businesses have a separate wash bay, uh, which is still on your site, uh, but it's still a part of your calculation. So these are things that you need to consider because every business is slightly different and it's quite impossible to develop a form that fits every single possible scenario. So when you're doing this, uh, I didn't mention earlier, you can do this as a group if, you, uh, if that's preferable, using your safety committee, that would be fantastic, uh, involving your first aid uh, attendant, uh, perhaps a supervisor, getting those different uh, uh, people involved will give you a, an accurate uh, assessment in the process. Keep in mind, as I mentioned, the person needs to be competent. Uh, a good idea is um, once we're all wrapped up today, everyone who's went through this webinar will be competent and will be uh, more than capable and qualified of completing this process. Okay, well, I'm going to look at part G, and I'm hoping I'm making sense so far. Uh, because in, this is going to make a lot more sense when you see the completed example. So um, I appreciate uh, some of the comments that have been coming in. Uh, this is this is just fantastic. I'm loving the engagement. That's uh, that's what we love to see. Uh, so in part G. Uh, this is based on potential job tasks, so some of the potential job tasks that occur at your business. Uh, so we look at that, as well as your travel time to the nearest medical facility. So this SIG here allows you, a la carte, to select optional additional items that you may require. And this would help you provide enhanced first aid care. These items come from the CSA standard. Um, I will reiterate, these are optional items. And I'll use a good example. If, if your business regularly works at heights, you may want to add in immobilization equipment. Keep in mind, any equipment that you add from this list, there, it could require specialized training. 
Uh, myself, as a past medical first responder, I've used every piece of equipment on this list more than once, and I would be comfortable using any piece of equipment on this list as I'm trained to do so. Uh, that may not be the case at every other business. So again, this just allows you to itemize and select additional items that could enhance uh, your first aid kit uh, and the care that you provide. Um, so we, and we had some good discussion in this around the office. Like, well, I may not need a, uh, uh, a scoop stretcher if I'm 15 minutes away from um, a medical facility or uh, EMS services. So those are some ideas that come to mind. And uh, again, these are just optional things uh, that come directly out of the CSA standard. Uh, so feel free to stock up on any of those uh, uh, that you feel you may need based on potential job tasks at your business. Uh, the next part is part H. So in this table below, we would select the number of staff and apply the final score from the risk task from part D, which was on page one, to determine our first aid attendant and training requirements. And these requirements are laid out in the OHS regulations in Saskatchewan. I didn't, um, again, include those into this tool. There's only so long it needs to be, uh, but these, these tables are available if you, if you wanna know the difference between a class A attendant training requirements or a class B attendant, uh, you can contact us, uh, or even better, in the regulations that uh, you have in the handouts, uh, you're also able to navigate that, and uh, we can support you and, and help you uh, uh, look, look for that uh, type of item as well. So how this one works, again, is if, if we have um, 30 people in our business, and if we scored a 10, we would be looking for a class B attendant uh, to be trained in, at our workplace. So that's, um, again, this clearly outlines that uh, type of requirement. And I'd always want to reiterate, this is a minimum standard. Just because it calls for one class B attendant, there's nothing wrong with having more uh, than one class B attendant in the workplace. Uh, in case that person is sick, we're seeing a lot of absences in the workplace. We're seeing uh, uh, sometimes people are on vacation, whatever the case may be. Um, it's a good risk management to have more than one person trained that can provide that type of care. But this here tool does outline that uh, minimum requirement uh, for you to train to. Uh, the very last component is the due diligence piece where you would have, you'd fill in again the date that you completed this, because the date may be different from when you started it uh, to when you completed it. And the, you would complete the name of the competent person or persons that completed this. Again, it could be uh, your safety committee, it could be your class A attendant that completed this. And then who reviewed it? Uh, was it the safety committee co-chair, supervisor? Uh, so we're signing off uh, who completed it and we're printing their names. So again, this is uh, um, how we would, would go through that form. Uh, we did put some key notes on the bottom. Uh, when there's multiple locations, this needs to be completed for each physical work site. So keep that in mind. And I've, I've made that fairly, fairly clear. The review of this annually uh, needs to be done. So this isn't a once and done activity. Uh, this needs to be completed for each physical work site. So every address uh, that your business has, uh, you need to have one of these for each physical address. Review this annually and whenever there are significant changes. So I mentioned uh, significant changes. If all of a sudden I go from selling parts to spring on box liners, that's a significant change. And just to give you some uh, documentation support, uh, the CSA standard, uh, which I spoke to, gives you a little bit more insight on this, as well as the uh, OHS regulations that were uh, revamped and released 
Uh, the release date was earlier this month uh, in part five, table nine. And before I jump into the appendix, uh, first aid kit types, and then our completed first aid kit risk assessments, I'll mention a couple of notes I made. Uh, MSA is not does not sell first aid kits, so uh, we're not here uh, selling first aid kits uh, or anything like that. Uh, uh, but I will mention uh, on our website, we have our member discounts and we have a working partnership with St. John Ambulance. And when you use the promo code MSA10, you're able to receive a 10% discount on first aid kits as well as training that they offer. And this is applicable for our members. So some good opportunities as well to save money for our membership by obtaining that type of discount. So that gives you, a, gives you an idea of, of the discount that they offer. And, and I will run through the appendixes now, uh, the different first aid kit types. I won't go through these uh, word by word. Uh, you have the appendix uh, in front of you uh, in the assessment tool. Uh, so the appendix A, this was uh, the first aid kit types, uh, type one for loan workers. Uh, the next was our type twos uh, for moderate risk activities. And you can see by the uh, staff size, it, it outlines uh, different contents that um, would be added into that first aid kit when you order it from your supplier. And then lastly, our type three kits. So again, I don't uh, need to go over and uh, discuss each of those uh, itemized items, but it is here for your reference uh, when you are considering your different first aid kit types uh, that you may need to order. So now if we're uh, hopefully sitting in a little better place uh, than we were a half an hour ago uh, when this webinar started, I'm going to go through uh, a completed example right now. And then again, we will entertain uh, any questions um, at the end. So please keep those questions coming in. I see Nathan's been doing a great job of, uh, of answering these type of uh, questions and uh, we will uh, look at those once completed. So this is a completed example that uh, we drew up here internally just to give you a bit of a visual of what to expect uh, or what a, a completed assessment tool could look like. Doesn't mean it has to look like this, it could look like this. So you would put in your business name and location, uh, this business did it by department, which was their service department, and they itemized the, the date that it had occurred on. At the business ABC Repair, they looked at the different job tasks and came up with the list of frequent overall job tasks that occur at that physical location. And they assessed those tasks with the severity, frequency, and probability as defined earlier in the presentation. They then summed up each of those categories to come up with their total risk rating, okay? And when they've done that, it, um, they came up with the score. And as you can see, we highlighted the top one because it is the highest score rating. That is essentially the only item that I need to worry about when it comes to a score in determining my first aid kit requirements, because we always want to base our first aid kit requirements and training needs for first aid attendance based on the highest risk job that's itemized because that's what we want to be prepared for, okay? So that's scored as an eight. Uh, our Part B scored as a 1 because the business is very close to a medical facility. And uh, when they took a overall look at the tasks that occur at their business, uh, they came up with a 2 for their score. So we took 8 plus 1 plus 2 from the respected parts A, B, and C to come up with a score of 11. 
So when we look at our score of 11, we go down into our part E component, and this is where we're looking at our first eight kits and our first eight kit type selection. So because that's scored an 11, we've made the determination that a type two basic first aid kit would be what would be used based on the risk level assessed at our business. And with that being said, uh, our staff at ABC Repair is a staff of 30. So with 30 staff members, we scored this right here as 26 to 50. Now I'm ready to contact my first aid kit supplier and say, I have went through a first aid kit risk assessment. Uh, we've came in at a moderate risk. I have 30 staff and I would be able to obtain the first aid kits uh, based on the supplier's uh, recommendations and the completion of the tool that I completed, okay? So that's how that would look. Uh, again, when I look at part G, just to give you an example, I've now looked at uh, some of the potential jobs that occur at ABC Repair. Uh, I've, I know where I, I sit as far as uh, in relation to the distance to my medical facility and the risk level, and I selected a few other things that I just want to have additional, which would provide some um, enhanced medical care if needed. So these were optional items that um, the competent person completing this form would have selected, okay? So that would be uh, how that uh, could look. It doesn't have to look like this, as I mentioned, but these are items that you could potentially order if you need them based on the tasks that occur. And these items, again, come out of the CSA standard as options that you could use, okay? Uh, so then when we move on to the uh, the last component of this uh, piece, the, the part H, we are able to determine that, well, I have a staff of 30, we scored an 11, so I need to have at least a class B attendant in the workplace, uh, so that would be what I would select for my minimum training requirements. Uh, there's nothing wrong with having more than one class B attendant trained, uh, but this is what would be determined uh, set out by the provincial regulations within table nine, okay? So that's what we will uh, think about uh, as we uh, then go to ensure that we have adequate first aid attendants trained. Uh, lastly, again, we have our due diligence piece, which uh, again puts the date on that this assessment occurred. We it was completed by Bill Smith, which is a very competent person, and reviewed by committee members Karen Jensen and Tom Johnson, and they would have signed there. Uh, so that gives you a, an idea of what a completed assessment tool could look like. Again, it will not need to uh, look like that for, uh, for every need or every business, as some may be slightly different, uh, depending on every business has some slightly different circumstances. And uh, those are um, what you would evaluate and weigh when conducting this type of assessment. So this gets us to the end of uh, the formal part of the presentation. And we do have some questions, which I'm quite excited to take a look at. I haven't looked at them yet. Uh, I have one of my staff members that asked about 10 questions. I think we'll deal with that later, uh, just because, of, boy, that'll burn up a lot of time uh, going through those. Uh, but with that being said, uh, uh, if you do have to leave, uh, you can do so. But if you do stay on for the Q&A, that'd be fantastic. Uh, but if you do go, I'll just make a couple a closing note before I address the questions while giving you a chance to answer to supply any more questions you may have. Um, that uh, once this is all said and done, uh, you will receive a follow up email. Uh, within that follow up email, there will be a uh, 
the attachments that we would have discussed today. So you'll have those attachments as well as we have a link that allows you to complete a short multiple choice quiz which will generate a certificate, uh, therefore deeming you as a competent uh, person on this activity. So if you do have to jump out early, um, that's something that uh, you're able to watch your inbox. Those will be coming your way with the link to the quiz. Uh, so this time, Nathan, uh, if uh, you're with me here, uh, uh, again, we'll uh, look at the, the questions from the membership and uh, address those. And what I can also do too is uh, we could sum up um, all of the questions and go through those uh, in the follow-up email, but we'll go through uh, through them here, start to finish. If you want to kind of help me out here, um, we'll we'll take a look at at those uh, as well. I think the uh, sound ones we got those uh, taken care of, which were great. And. Um, yeah, someone asked a question, is it true table eight in the new regulations is not being used? And that is something I will have to look at. I will uh, have to get back to you. I cannot uh, comment for sure uh, on table eight in the new regulations that came out on April 1st. Uh, if there's a change or what's different to that, uh, that wasn't, uh, I know it wasn't covered in the slides. So I will um, definitely put that in into the follow-up email as I'm, I'm not able to competently answer that question at this time. Uh, someone asked, can we keep the assessment in the first aid kit? Um, sure, as long as it's readily available, you can keep that first aid kit assessment um, again in your safety board, uh, in the first aid kit assessment area, wherever you keep your first aid kits. Um, but that's just fine as long as it's uh, it's readily available. That's more or less a decision that uh, you would make uh, internally at your own business. Uh, someone asked, "Is this done as a group?" Is this a group activity? And we kind of spoke to that. Uh, if you are in a safety committee, uh, that's fine to do it as a safety committee uh, or uh, having that competent person do it and you review it as a committee, I would, uh, I would recommend that as a minimum. So if the committee isn't doing it, if you have the competent person doing it and reviewing it as a group, uh, if your business does any type of risk assessment or hazard analysis, uh, we always look for that frontline worker engagement and participation. So it is recommended, but not required uh, in this situation. But uh, the more, uh, if you have a small focus group working on this, again, a committee member or a um, first aid attendant, a couple of people involved, uh, I think you're going to get a more accurate uh, score, uh, which will ultimately help you determine your first aid kit needs, as well as training requirements. Uh, someone asked about what's a medical facility, is a doctor's clinic considered? I think we kind of covered that one off if it uh, covers, um, if, if you're able to receive medical care, uh, you would use that in, in the assessment. And I got to mention too, uh, in rural Saskatchewan, there's a lot of hospitals, but a lot of them don't have doctors in them. So those are things uh, that you would uh, consider when you are uh, uh, completing this tool where you can actually get health care from. Uh, someone asked, how would you score both a high and low risk rating in Part C? Uh, so what I would do, again, as mentioned, uh, if if you find that if there's different departments, if, say, for example, your admin department may score low, uh, but your service department scores high, I would build this kit needs uh, to the highest need at that location. So if you have, uh, if you do this by department, and this is a great question, if depart each department scores different for that matter, I would, uh, again, as mentioned, build your needs based on the highest possible need for, therefore you're gonna be covered and have adequate first aid supplies and training on uh, training available for those type of people to provide care at your business.
Uh, so yeah, someone kind of reiterated that exact point. They said, so why break it down and do it by department if you're just going to uh, apply the highest score? I guess my question, my follow-up to that would be is without doing it by department, I wouldn't be sure what that highest score is. So that's why you could, uh, I guess you could assume maybe that uh, your service department is a higher risk than your admin department and just opt to do it for your service department. But uh, again, that's uh, a choice, uh, you know, the competent person could make uh, when they are filling this out because uh, you are looking at your business overall. So what are those overall job tasks? And depending on the structure of your business, you could break it down by department. Uh, if you're a small body shop with seven people, you're likely going to do it just as the whole business itself. So, uh, yeah, great, uh, great question. But I think by going through the assessment, uh, you'll be able to determine what um, uh, where the where your scoring is. And then therefore, you're able to. Uh, build based on those needs from that from that score so that's a that's a great question and uh, again until you do it you're not sure where that score will be um, as i mentioned earlier people who have done uh, risk assessments or hazard analysis in the past uh, they're probably at a bit of an advantage point because they know uh, they have documentation of where their risks and hazards uh, how they score and how they've been assessed, and they can use that information uh, to complete this. So that's uh, that definitely uh, helps you out on that. Uh, someone asked about should uh, service trucks or uh, mobile type of workers have their own first aid kit risk assessments done? Uh, great question. So this here tool is built for locations. So we, um, if you would build this, this is built again for the location site. So if you have people that are mobile workers, uh, if that is that a separate department, uh, you could have an assessment done for them. But when I look at it, um, unless you have more than one person going out uh, on a service call, this is set up um, when we look at a type one kit, those are for lone workers. So it's kind of itemized already. Uh, in that regards, uh, for, for loan workers, if that's the situation, if you have people going on service calls by themselves, uh, you could itemize uh, that as a job task that we go on service calls and uh, determine you have uh, training requirements for that and first aid. But it's only as good as the access to uh, if you are going with somebody who can provide first aid care. So again, this will be a determination of your business if you're going to send more than one per people out a service call. If if that's uh, if it, depending on the risk of the job, that's something that you would assess. I'm not telling you to do that. Uh, this would be a decision that uh, that you would make based on the jobs that uh, that worker is doing. But of course, you want to ensure that uh, uh, all staff have adequate uh, protection of the first aid kits that they need, as well as the training uh, of first aid attendants to provide that care. Uh, somebody asked, is there a grace period? Well, I do know that uh, this was came into effective legislation April 1st. And I'm sure. Most businesses already have some type of uh, first aid training uh, kits. They have first aid kits on hand. They've already had first aid kit um, attendants trained at their first aid attendants trained, pardon me. Uh, as for grace period, I, I cannot say that's a decision of the Occupational Health and Safety Division. Um, I, and I, I can't comment on uh, how they would uh, roll this out uh, once the legislation is in place. But it is effective, and uh, I wouldn't delay too long in carrying out with this because uh, it is something that uh, you are going to obviously need done, and it is now a, a legislative requirement. I'm just reading through the questions here, so just uh, bear with me. Uh, someone asked, can you clarify what types of operations may need a class B attendant? Uh, it seems excessive to most operations. Uh, actually, no, sorry, I cannot um, determine, uh, determine that um, off the top of my head. Um, 
um, without uh, having the uh, the class A attendant, a class B attendant uh, descriptors in front of me, uh, I wouldn't be able to give you an accurate uh, type of job task that would that would do that. Uh, again, how you score your job based on risk and the number of staff will prescribe that. Uh, but these, again, these requirements for uh, first aid uh, training for attendance, uh, those, yeah, those are outlined in the table nine. But I will look into that and provide some examples uh, in a follow-up email uh, of that. So that would give some, some ideas uh, in that response. Uh, someone asked uh, for part C, so bear with me, I'm just going to go to part C here. Uh, they're wondering if a, um, would a, a car dealership in general be considered moderate risk? Um, is that a judgment call per dealership? So yeah, absolutely it would be a judgment call. And that's, that's the thing I, I will mention with any type of assessment that we cover, um, it's based on the experience of the person who's doing the assessment. Uh, you could look at past injury trends. Uh, if you had a lot of injuries at that car dealership, I'd be, yeah, I'd be maybe considering that a high risk and not a moderate risk. Sometimes we see car dealerships, salespeople actually having more injuries than service people. Uh, if they're going in and out of the parking lot with uh, uh, footwear that may not be uh, very responsive to different ter terrain, um, being people hit in the parking lot with high visibility or lack of traffic control. So uh, it, it depends on the car dealership itself, uh, their injury trends. Um, but what I will mention when you are scoring these assessments, just a key component, and we train this in our courses, is consistency. If if I'm scoring this, if I'm, how I score this and my perception, I need to carry that same level of stringency across the whole assessment. Uh, when I look at my severity or frequency or probability in part A, how I then score part B and part C should be used with the same scope uh, and the same stringency at that time. So I wouldn't, uh, I'd have to be consistent in my scoring as well. So that, uh, I'm just gonna double check here uh, if we've, we've got through everything. So just bear with me here. I just wanna, I'm just gonna go through the, the questions here again, just double checking uh, everything. Um, yeah, so someone asked again, so on part G, so these were those optional activity or optional first aid items. Um, would that be for the tasks that uh, we assessed or would this be for all tasks? And um, it, it could be for both. You could be determining this on, uh, hopefully you would have itemized those potential frequent job tasks in part A and those carry down into part G. Um, if you didn't, um, that's why um, when you do this by department or locations, you're able to uh, look at those different job tasks. So it could very well, you may catch all some items that you didn't include in Part A in Part G when you're determining additional items. Uh, so that's something that um, uh, when we get through those types of assessments, we're able to uh, determine uh, those additional needs based on items that you do at your business. So it's really meant uh, to be what are those frequent overall tasks that occur in Part A and Part G is what are those potential job tasks? So there's a little difference. So Part A is this is what we're doing frequently. And part G is, hey, these are potential. So I don't do them very often, but you know what? We do these occasionally. So occasionally I, I do work at heights. So we should be, um, uh, we, or we could also look at immobilization equipment. So it, it allows you, again, a la carte, to look at potential jobs where part A is frequent jobs. So that's a, uh, that's a good uh, a good uh, good point of clarification. Uh, 
Uh, I'm just actually backtracking here on another question that I missed. Uh, can you speak to portability of first aid kits? Does your risk grading kit need to be portable? Can you then have a lower risk for portable kits? Uh, great question that I do not know the answer to. I have not come across that uh, in my uh, assessment tools here. So I, I do apologize. I don't have a, an answer on that. And that's uh, one that I will uh, look for in, in our response email that goes out to people. So great question. I We love to get stumped because if you run into a question, it means someone else has a question uh, on that as well, that we could all benefit from that feedback. Uh, looks like one of the last questions, where do first aider class requirements come from? And those are defined in the, in the regulations where we look at the, uh, the class A and class B. Those are in table nine. Uh, those are um, in, in the regulation. So in the attachment, uh, SASC OHS regulations 2020, uh, if one were to scroll to near the end to table nine, uh, you would see those differences between class A attendance and class B attendance as well. So that's those are some good questions. I'm just going to uh, uh, just allow another moment for any other questions while I just do a quick scroll through, sure that we've covered everything off. Just double checking here. I want to make sure we've given everyone a chance and then we've went through everything. I looks like we're good. Looks like we've went through uh, everything that we couldn't answer here to, today with your questions. The ones that we weren't able to answer, um, again, I do apologize for. It is a little bit new, something different that uh, uh, that. Um, that's you know that we're working with it's a new process and there are some questions so that's great uh, but before I let uh, everyone go I'm gonna just launch you with uh, with one more poll here uh, again to kind of take your temperature now that the uh, the webinar is uh, just wrapping up here so at the conclusion of this webinar how do I feel am I confident I will still require some guidance or I have the necessary tools to be successful so uh, I'm hopeful um, we can uh, we can get uh, we get through this uh, poll. So I'll give you a, a moment to answer that. So as as those uh, final responses are coming in on the poll, I. Again, I just want to take this time to thank everyone for going through the process with us this morning. I know it's new, so when something new comes out, it's it's a change and it's different, and it's a bit of a learning curve that applies to us when we first heard there were some changes. But, you know, we had to wrap up, do some research, and get the CSA standard and build the tool. I'm quite, quite, quite proud of the tool that our staff has developed. Uh, we've had uh, reach outs from WorkSafe Saskatchewan that they want to uh, utilize this tool and uh, brand it. So uh, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So you'll see more of this tool. Other associations have requested it. So this is something that we will uh, probably see more so uh, around, the, around the province. And um, so I'm quite proud of our staff for being able to put this type of uh, tool together. And as mentioned, you'll receive the follow-up email shortly uh, that's going to come out. And in that email, uh, actually, it may t I may send two emails. I'm going to send the first email that uh, will give you the link for the quiz, which will make you a competent person, as well as uh, the attachments. And I'll send the second email with the answer and summarization of the Q&A, uh, just so we're not having that delay period between both. So that being said, I'm going to close out the poll here and uh, let's take a look at these results. I hope this isn't a measure of, of how we did today. Uh, <laughs> we'll take a look. So 51% of you are confident about completing the tool, uh, one of these assessments. 
uh, 30, another 34 uh, percent believe they have the necessary tools to be successful. Uh, and there's 15 percent that still requires some extra guidance. And that's uh, that's perfectly uh, fine. I know when we started, we were at uh, 88 percent and 12 percent uh, variables on our first poll. Uh, so uh, with that being said, um, we are here to support you. Um, our contact uh, number is 306 seven two one zero six eight eight and our email address again is info at motorsafety.ca as mentioned we we're doing a training one-on-one -on -one with a business this afternoon and we can do the same with other businesses virtually if they are in that 15 percent group that requires some extra guidance so we're here to support you don't feel that we're uh, we're leaving you uh, behind here and after we log off because that's not the case we want to work with you and ensure that you have the necessary tools necessary and um, remember the promo code msa10 uh, from St. John Ambulance if you do need any first aid kits or training uh, requirements. So with that, I'd like to thank you to again for joining us in this webinar. And again, as I close out reflecting on the day of morning today uh, and thanking everyone for joining today. Thank you.